Hare Krishna and welcome to Sage Cottage in County Wicklow, Republic of Ireland. I'm Kumadas. Today I'm going to be doing a little something special. We're going to be reading from my book, The Great Transcendental Adventure, from beginning to end. We'll begin the recital of this book um, to enliven you and share these wonderful transcendental pastimes. This book uh, was compiled a few decades ago and um, I'm enjoying sharing the information that it contains. I'll start the book from the preface. Omagyanatimirandasya gyananjana salakaya chaksurun militam yena tasmai sri gurave namaha shri chaitanya manobistam stapitam yena bhutale Swayam Rupagada Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam. The Great Transcendental Adventure. Preface. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada's primary interest was in glorifying the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna by writing many volumes of books about him. Srila Prabhupada was convinced that a person's insatiable thirst to hear descriptive stories of others in newspapers, magazines, novels, films and social media could be fully quenched by reading such transcendental literature. While Srila Prabhupada stressed that the devotees should absorb themselves in topics of the Lord, he did not regard his personal history as a subject for study. You may then ask why such a book as the one that you are about to hear has been written at all. Well, according to spiritual science, the pure devotees of Krishna are as worshipable as the Lord himself because the Lord and his devotees are both on the transcendental plane. Thus, hearing about Lord Krishna and his pure devotees are equally good. And just as one derives tangible spiritual benefit just by hearing about Lord Krishna, the same is true of hearing about his devotees. Srila Prabhupada has written in his purports to Srimad Bhagavatam, quote, As the pastimes and activities of the Supreme Lord are pleasing to hear, hearing about his devotees, who are very dear to the Supreme Person, is also pleasing and potent. If one simply reads over and over again about such pastimes, one can attain the highest perfection of life in any way he desires. Most importantly, he gets the chance of becoming a great devotee. To become a great devotee means to finish all miserable conditions of materialistic life. End of quote. The extraordinary details of the life of Srila Prabhupada are an important and absorbing subject. Not only are they enjoyable and uplifting, but they are also tangible proof of the existence of spiritual reality and love of God. Srila Prabhupada visited Australia six times and New Zealand three times between 1971 and 1976. Srila Prabhupada stayed a total of 80 days. Srila Prabhupada personally installed the three sets of deities that are now worshipped in Sydney, Melbourne and Auckland. In the cool, refreshing morning hours, brisk in some cases, Srila Prabhupada took a total of 25 morning walks at 15 different parks, gardens, beaches around Australia and New Zealand. He gave a total of 68 morning and evening classes there on Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita and Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Srila Prabhupada was eager to speak to whomever would hear his messengers. messengers. Many guests heard from Srila Prabhupada in his various rooms around the Yatra. These people included a bishop, priests, reporters, monks, scientists, politicians, trade union leaders, mothers and fathers of devotees, journalists, surfers, writers, doctors, nurses, psychiatrists, students, members of the Indian community, initiated disciples, and aspirant and wayward 
disciples. Srila Prabhupada spoke at 20 public speaking engagements in Australia and New Zealand, including university schools, TV stations, monasteries, town halls, chapels, hotels, an art gallery, Indian community halls, theatres, etc. While in Australia and New Zealand, Srila Prabhupada also worked on his translations and commentaries to Srimad Bhagavatam Cantos 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 and Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. He completed the preface to his Bhagavad Gita as it is in Sydney on May the 12th, 1971. Srila Prabhupada danced at the 1974 Melbourne Rathayatra Festival. He gave eight press conferences, presided over 11 fire yagyas, and initiated over 200 disciples in Australia and New Zealand. I, the humble author, Kormadas, thus had rich resources from which I gathered information for this book. Audio recordings um, actually made up... Um, a great uh, bulk of the research, lectures, uh, morning walk conversations and room conversations were all recorded. There were letters, there were books, media coverage from newspapers, magazines and television films, videos, photographs and some personal recollections also. Uh, but by far the most significant, rich and detailed material that I gathered for this book came from the 180 or so persons whom I interviewed between 1992 and 19... I was going to sneeze. <clears throat> but by far, the most significant, rich and detailed material that I gathered was from the 180 or so persons that I interviewed for this book between 1992 and 1995. This whole book actually took me five years to produce. Those uh, fortunate souls whom I interviewed were able to recall their association, be it brief or ongoing, with Srila Prabhupada in connection with his mission in Australia and New Zealand. Piecing together these recollections was like uh, assembling a giant transcendental jigsaw puzzle. It was a long and very rewarding task. Along with describing Srila Prabhupada's visits, I have also interwoven the history of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, ISKCON, in Australia and New Zealand. Such a history, of course, cannot be separated from the life of Srila Prabhupada. The complete picture in the shape of this book is an honest, although flawed, attempt to glorify my spiritual master. Srila Prabhupada's personal life created an astounding and permanent impression on the world. My hope is that I have been successful in revealing a glimpse of his amazing and exemplary South Seas pastimes. The establishment, nourishment and maintenance of his International Society for Krishna Consciousness in Australia and New Zealand the great transcendental adventure. Signed, Korma Das, 11th of March, 1998, Gaur Pornima, Melbourne, Mahaprabhu Mandir, Melbourne, Australia. Um, before I carry on, I'd just like to give you an insight as to why the book is called what it is called. It is the great transcendental adventure pastimes of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada in Australia and New Zealand. Um, of course, Australia and New Zealand are two separate places uh, with rugged uh, individual uh, residents, uh, which whom, uh, who uh, don't like to be confused for being each other. But uh, I decided to include New Zealand and Australia because they are connected geographically. And every time Prabhupada visited Australia, he visited New Zealand. And, uh, and so I've included the New Zealand pastimes. Also, a word about the title, The Great Transcendental Adventure. This was a, a term that was used and coined by Srila Prabhupada himself. Perfectly applicable. He wrote in a letter to Bali Mardana 
um, one of the, the first devotee to come to Australia, which we'll, which we'll be reading about, he wrote him a letter, quote, I take it for granted that you are one of the selected devotees of Lord Chaitanya, and therefore from, from within your heart, he has inspired you to go to such a distant place, leaving your parents and home, just to satisfy Krishna. This is the great transcendental adventure. Try your best, and I'm sure you will be successful. So I'll read you the introduction, which also sheds some important light. Introduction. The teachings of Krishna consciousness have existed since time immemorial within India's Sanskrit Vedic literature and are the origin and essence of all religious expression. Until His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada began his worldwide preaching, Krishna consciousness in its original purity had never been widely spread. In the most popular and basic Vedic text, Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna teaches that he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and that real religion, real knowledge and real endeavour can be understood only when we dedicate our lives to the loving service of the Lord. Such a life of full surrender leads to freedom from the stringent law of karma and the cycle of repeated birth and death. The life of His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami is the epitome of such full self-surrender. Srila Prabhupada was raised as a Krishna conscious child from the very beginning of his life. His father, Gaur Mohande, a pure devotee of Krishna, had trained his son since childhood to worship Lord Krishna. In Prabhupada's boyhood, Gaur Mohan instructed him how to play the Madanga. He gave his son Radha and Krishna deities to worship as well as Lord Jagannath's chariot, so he, that he could observe the Rathayatra festival as his childhood play. Gaur Mohan was kind to his son, and from his father, Prabhupada imbibed the ideas that were later on solidified by his spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, whom he addressed as the Eternal Father. Srila Prabhupada wrote of this first encounter with his spiritual master, and his subsequent extraordinary life in a detailed letter sent to Hanuman Prasad Podda, a well-known patron of Indian religious thought and head of the publishing company Gita Press, in a letter on the 5th of March, 1970. So here's an excerpt. Sometime in the year 1922, when I was acting as the manager of Dr. Bose's Laboratory Limited, so this is Srila Prabhupada, writing and speaking. I was fortunate enough to meet my spiritual master, His Divine Grace, Om Vishnupad, Paramahansa, Paribhajakacharya, 108, Sri Srimad, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada. On the very first meeting with His Divine Grace, he asked me to preach the message of Lord Chaitanya in the Western world. At that time, I was a young man and a nationalist admirer of Mahatma Gandhi and C.R. Das. So I replied at that time, who would care for the message of Lord Chaitanya when we are a subject nation? In this way, I had some argument with my spiritual master and at the end, I was defeated. But at that time, because I was already married, I could not take his words very seriously. In this way, I passed on as a householder but by the causeless mercy of my divine master, that order of preaching was impressed upon my heart. I was initiated in 1933 at Allahabad when Sir Malcolm Haley, the then governor of UP, opened our Gaudiya Mutt branch there. Then in 1936, my spiritual master left this world, leaving a message for me that it would be better for me to preach in the English language. So I was thinking very seriously. And then as late as 1944, I started my paper back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada continues, Gradually in 1954, I retired from my family life and began to live alone in Mathura, Brindaban. In 1959, I was awarded sannyas 
by one of my god brothers, His Holiness B.P. Keshava Maharaj. Then I began translating Srimad Bhagavatam in 1960. With great difficulty, I then published the second and third volume of Srimad Bhagavatam until 1965 when I prepared myself to come to this country, America, with great books, with, with some books. Well, they were great books, with some books, Prabhupada writes. With great difficulty, I was able to get the P form passed by the controller of foreign exchange and some way or other, I reached Boston on the 17th of September, 1965. I was thinking while on board the ship, Jaladuta, why Krishna has brought me to this country. I knew that Western people are too much addicted to so many forbidden things, according to our Vedic conception of life. So out of sentiment, I wrote a long poetry addressing Lord Krishna as to what was his purpose in bringing me to this country. Prabhupada, of course, addresses it as sentiment. We see it as spiritual ecstasy. At that time, I was sponsored by my friend's son, Gopal Agarwal, who was settled up in this country by marrying an American girl known as Sally. I was their guest, and I feel very much obliged to Gopal and his wife, Sally, for their nice treatment and reception. I was with them for three weeks in Butler, near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then I came to New York. I was getting some money by selling my Shmod Bhagavatam, thus I was maintaining myself in New York. After some time, I rented one apartment at number 171st Street West, but after a few months, all my things, typewriter, tape recorder, books, were stolen. Then for some time, out of my st one of my students gave me shelter at Bowery Street. I then rented one storefront and an apartment at 26 Second Avenue, for $200 per month. But without any source of income, I started my classes and sometime, sometimes on Sundays, I used to chant Hare Krishna Mantra in Tompkins Square Park from 3 to 5 p.m. During this time, all the young boys and girls used to gather around me. Sometimes Poet Ginsburg would come to see me and sometimes a reporter from the New York Times came to see me. And in this way, the Hare Krishna mantra, chanting, became very popular on the Lower East Side. In this way, the younger generation became attracted and gradually many branches were opened one after another. End of quote. From a letter to Hanuman Prasad Poda from Srila Prabhupada in 19... 70. Srila Prabhupada was painfully aware of the sorry state of society. I'm continuing to read from the introduction. As he later said, I have come here in this old age neither for sightseeing nor for personal interest. It is for implementing the science of Krishna, which will actually make people happy. He was convinced that to engage others in devotional service to Lord Krishna was the highest welfare activity. As he wrote to Hanuman, Prasad, Poda, practically I have experienced that this Krishna consciousness movement can solve all the problems of the world. To this end, Prabhupada systematically established his International Society for Krishna Consciousness, ISKCON. The purposes of his society, stated with ISKCON's Articles of Incorporation, drawn up on the 11th of July, 1966, revealed his broad and far reaching vision of the future. And here are those articles of incorporation. Seven purposes of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. A, to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge to society at large and to educate all people in this technique of spiritual life in order to check the imbalance of values in life and to achieve real unity and peace in the world. B, to propagate a consciousness of Krishna as is revealed in the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. C, to bring the members of the society together with each other and nearer to Krishna, the prime entity, thus to develop the idea with the members and humanity at large that each soul 
is part and parcel of the quality of Godhead, Krishna. D, to teach and encourage the Sankirtan movement, congregational chanting of the holy name of God as revealed in the teachings of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. E, to erect for the members and for society at large a holy place of transcendental pastimes dedicated to the personality of Krishna. F, to bring their members close together for the purpose of teaching a simple and more natural way of life. And G, for the view, with a view towards achieving the aforementioned purposes to publish and distribute periodicals, magazines, books and other writings. Such a charter was clearly the beginnings of the fulfilment of a scriptural prediction of a spiritual movement destined to flourish for 10,000 years in the midst of this decadent age of Kali. This golden age of spiritual renaissance beginning after the advent of Lord Chaitanya was also foretold by Lord Chaitanya himself when he said, that's actually from the Chaitanya Bhagavata. Translation, in every town and village, the chanting of my holy name will be heard. Prabhupada's godbrothers had often wondered about this statement. Perhaps that verse should be taken symbolically, they said. Otherwise, what could it mean? Krishna in every town? But Srila Prabhupada had deep faith in Lord Chaitanya's statement and in the instruction of his spiritual master. After establishing ISKCON's first centre at 26 Second Avenue in the Lower East Side of New York in 1966, Prabhupada travelled and engaged his disciples in travelling to open centres in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, Montreal, Buffalo and Seattle. The expansion was rapid and vigorous and in the middle of May 1967, Srila Prabhupada appeared to suffer from a debilitating stroke. He retired to India for preaching and recuperation and returned to America some seven months later on the 14th of December 1967. It was after this return to America, as Srila Prabhupada would comment several years later, that the Krishna consciousness movement in its present form really started to take shape. Prabhupada now knew that he had limited time and that in whatever period remained, he had to accomplish his mission. From 1965 to 1967, Srila Prabhupada had concentrated on establishing Krishna consciousness mainly in America. By 1968, however, it became evident that Prabhupada intended to spread Krishna consciousness throughout the whole world. The story of the revolutionary spread of Krishna consciousness across the planet has filled many books and will surely continue to do so. I did a count the other day. We have 182 books in print, published, written about the life of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. 182 biographical books. Remarkable. This volume is a chronicle of the birth and growth of the Krishna consciousness movement in Australia and New Zealand between the years 1968 and 1977. I invite you to relish this account and I pray that by doing so, you will gain an understanding and appreciation of the exalted life of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. End of introduction. So let's begin the reading of The Great Transcendental Adventure, Chapter 1, This Novel Idea. Early days, 1968 to 1970. Here's a quote from Srila Prabhupada. Just try to convince the younger section about the importance of this movement and how this one single venture can solve all the problems of the world. Krishna consciousness is not dry. It includes all varieties of human cultivation uh, of knowledge. 
We can give directions in politics, in sociology, in religion, in philosophy, in arts, music, aesthetics. It is complete. Simply, we have to administer this novel idea to the people in general very magnificently. That was a letter from Srila Prabhupada to Balimadan and Upendra, who we will be reading more about as we continue. So the story begins in Montreal in the, uh, 1968, in fact, on the 12th of July. The Montreal Temple of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness was a converted bowling alley on the top floor of the large grey Gothic-style building near McGill University. Srila Prabhupada was staying in a small apartment nearby. Up until his arrival from Boston some days before, devotees had been scurrying around here and there, making various last-minute arrangements for his comfort. Now the apartment was quiet. Prabhupada sat peacefully on a thin mat behind his metal footlocker, surrounded by the familiar aroma of incense, sandalwood and gardenias. The morning's mail had arrived, and he had read it with interest. Jayananda's report on the recent successful Rathiatra festival in San Francisco was heartwarming. Satsvarupa had written from Alston, Massachusetts, describing his plans to establish an ashram facility for unmarried female devotees in this temple. Subal and Umapati both wrote concerned letters from Santa Fe. Umapati informed Prabhupada that due to financial need, he was looking for a job to help pay the rent on the new centre there. As a young brahmachari, Chidananda Das had also written, asking various philosophical questions. And as was his daily custom, Prabhupada replied to them all. As well as answering Chidananda's questions in depth, he responded with encouragement to a letter received from the young boy, four days previously. Chidananda had been enlivened on hearing news of various Godbrothers' successes in opening new centres across North America. He had written to Srila Prabhupada outlining his plans to go to Australia to start a branch there. Prabhupada replied, quote, When you go to Australia, you must take with you one madanga and at least four pairs of symbols to begin kirtan immediately there. When I came to your country in 1965, I brought with me only one pair of symbols and it has increased to so many pairs, at least 50 pairs. And I came here without madanga. So when you go to Australia, you have to similarly increase the number of symbols proportionately, namely 50 times 4. That should be your mission, and I'm confident that you can do it because you are a sincere soul. If you can introduce this Krishna consciousness movement in such a distant place, Lord Chaitanya will pour his incessant blessings upon you and your life will be glorious. In this connection, I may give you an example of the boy Subala, who is struggling in Santa Fe. Although he's not very much qualified from the worldly point of view, still his struggle for existence in Krishna consciousness is advancing him more and more in spiritual realization. As far as I know about you, you are an intelligent, qualified and willing worker for Krishna consciousness. And I hope if you try to establish a center of our society in Sydney or any other important cities in Australia, it will be a record in the history of Lord Chaitanya's movement. I hope with this seriousness you will go there and I'm always praying to Lord Chaitanya to help you. He's very kind and he's always ready to help a willing worker. And as soon as you establish one centre, it may be that I may go there for some time and try to help you in your organisation from a letter to Chidananda Das. Prabhupada continued his young disciple that before leaving he would have to be assured of a job in Australia. 
Here in, here in America, you are working and you are getting some money. But in Australia, if you do not immediately get some occupation, it will be risky. So you must consider all these pros and cons intelligently. And then, depending on the grace of Krishna, you can go there chanting all the ways, Hare Krishna. Later, Prabhupada added, please keep me informed about your plans and programs for Australia. So that was in 1968. In his correspondence earlier that year, Prabhupada had repeatedly stressed the need to spread the movement widely. Quote, we want to open hundreds of centres so that people may take to Krishna consciousness and we need many enthusiastic boys and girls for carrying on this great mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Prabhupada had not confined himself to merely encouraging his disciples by, by mail. After returning from India to San Francisco, he had soon left for Los Angeles to give association to his young disciples there. Thus, in May, he had visited the new centre in Boston and while there had addressed students at Harvard University and MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In Montreal, his plans for spreading Krishna consciousness continued to unfold. A week later, in a letter to his disciple Shama Sundara in San Francisco, he outlined a bold new plan for sending a group of devotees to London. By mid-August 1968, three married couples were being trained personally by Prabhupada on the finer points of Kirtan and Bhajan, and by the end of the month, the young disciples had arrived in London. Over the next few months, centres opened in Tokyo and Hamburg, and in the near future, as evinced from Chidananda's enthusiastic plans, Australia would also soon be hosting Lord Krishna's devotees. In September of 1968, however, Srila Prabhupada was disappointed to hear that Chidananda had been unsuccessful in obtaining a visa. He had applied to visit Australia as a tourist rather than an immigrant and his visa application had been denied. Prabhupada wrote to his disciple Mukunda in London, quote, I thought that Chidananda could go to Australia, but that idea has not been successful because the man in Australia in charge is an atheist, and he scented or suspected that Chidananda is going to establish a centre of Hare Krishna. He has withdrawn his cooperation and that proves that his country is very unfortunate. End of quote. Srila Prabhupada, however, did not dismiss the idea of devotees going to Australia. In October of 1968, he wrote to Gora Sundara, quote, So combine together, try to establish a very nice centre in Hawaii. You organise the centre in such a way that we can, in future, open centres in Hong Kong, Tokyo, Fiji, Bangkok, Sydney and New Zealand and all neighbouring Pacific Islands. <coughs> Excuse me. Krishna consciousness continued to expand in North America. A temple had been purchased at Los Angeles at La Cienega Boulevard. Srila Prabhupada's new book, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya, had just been published and Prabhupada was working steadily on his two new books, Krishna and The Nectar of Devotion. January 1969 was the most productive book writing period in Prabhupada's life as he rapidly brought these two new books to completion. By June of that year, the deities of Radha and Krishna had been installed in Los Angeles, which was now becoming the epitome of success for the rest of the society. On the 26th of June, 1969, Srila Prabhupada travelled to San Francisco to preside over the Rathayatra festival. And in August and September of 1969, Srila Prabhupada journeyed to Hamburg and then London, where he stayed at Tittenhurst in October 1969 uh, at John Lennon's estate from the Beatles. It was here at Tittenhurst that Srila Prabhupada learnt of the recent developments to secure a foothold in Australia. Bali Mardan, a young brahmachari from New York, accompanied by his godbrother Sudama, was preaching Krishna consciousness in Japan. Japan. 
they would regularly chant together outside busy Shinjuku station in Tokyo, invariably attracting the attention of tourists and young Japanese men and women. Those interested would receive an invitation to the Sunday feast, and at one such festival, Bali Madan spoke to a young English boy who had just returned from a trip to Australia. The youth of that country, the boy explained, were becoming increasingly interested in yoga and meditation. The young boy also gave Bali Madan the address of a young couple in Sydney with whom he could correspond. Bali Madan started to think that since the Krishna consciousness movement was going on, going on nicely in Japan, he could be spared to open a branch in Australia. He wrote to Srila Prabhupada, submitting his idea. A week later, Bali Madan received a very enthusiastic response from Srila Prabhupada. Here's the response, quote, It is very, very encouraging that you propose to go to Australia. Formerly, I wanted to send Chidananda Das Brahmachari to Australia and he attempted to take permission to go there. Somehow or other, it was not fruitful. If you can now go there and start a centre, it will be certainly all glories to Sri Guru and Gauranga. So take information further in this connection and as you say that you are in correspondence with some friends there, this is all right. In the meantime, make the Kyoto Centre strong enough to stand up and then you can immediately attempt this great adventure. Krishna will help you. I think that when the winter season will prevail very much on the northern side of the world, the southern side of the world will compensate for the declining tendency of back to Godhead sales. There in New Zealand, Fiji Islands, etc. Um, so by the order of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we shall not leave any place within this world, at least without Krishna consciousness. End of quote from a letter to Bali Madan. Bali Madan immediately lodged a visa application at the Australian Embassy in Tokyo, being careful to avoid the mistakes that Chidananda had made. A few months later, he again wrote to Srila Prabhupada, who replied with another warm response, quote, I'm so pleased to receive your letter dated November the 7th, 1969, and have noted the contents carefully. You are a sincere devotee from the very beginning, coming of a very respectable family, intelligent, and your humbleness is proof of your high parentage. Thank you very much for this Vaishnava quality. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has advised a Vaishnava to be humbler than a straw and more tolerant than a tree. Then he can become a perfect preacher. So Krishna is giving you intelligence from within how to become a preacher in distant countries to fulfill the mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. By this attempt, only can we come within the perspective of the Lord's attention. Our endeavour should be not to see the Lord, but that the Lord may see us. He will see us when we become, his, in, when we become in his confidence by rendering service unto him. The very best service we can render is the preaching of his glories by which the hearer is glorified, the preacher is glorified, and the Lord is certainly glorified. I hope your application for an immigrant visa will be duly accepted because I know the Australian government is very much anxious to invite white people to domicile in Australia. So your application must be favourably treated. End of letter to Bali Madan. The story continues. Upendradas, a young American disciple of Srila Prabhupada, had until recently been Prabhupada's personal servant. Now, although the president of the Seattle temple, he again hankered after Prabhupada's personal association. He was depressed and had written asking Prabhupada's permission to resume his former service. Prabhupada had agreed on the condition that Upendra find a suitable replacement. Upendra found one. And soon, happily, 
took up his formal duties, former duties. One day in early January 1970, Upendra entered Prabhupada's room in his small rented house on the outskirts of Beverly Hills. Upendra's mail had been redirected to Los Angeles and it was the contents of one particular letter that had moved him to approach Srila Prabhupada that day. Upendra bowed his head on the floor and stood before Srila Prabhupada. Upendra recalls as follows. I had received a letter from Bali Mardan, a devotee whom I had never met. He was from New York and I was from the West Coast. He had sent out letters to the temple presidents asking if they had anyone spare in their temple to help him in Australia. Apparently his visa application had been lodged and he was ready to go. Since I was no longer the president of Seattle, I went to Prabhupada to ask what to do with this letter. I guess Krishna must have really covered my intelligence because I said, Srila Prabhupada, I have a letter here from Bali Madan. He wants a devotee to go to Australia with him. Can you suggest someone? I handed Srila Prabhupada the letter and stood there as Prabhupada looked first at the letter and then at me. He kept staring at me. I looked sideways and then back. And he was still looking. I thought, Krishna, no. Then I voiced my worst fears. No, Srila Prabhupada, not me. Prabhupada smiled and said, yes, you should go. No, I said half-heartedly. I, I, I'm serving you here. I'm doing your cooking. I'm doing your massage. I'm cleaning your room. But Prabhupada cut me off. And in a matter-of-fact sort of way, he said, oh, anyone can be my servant. But preaching is something special. Besides, you were doing much better service in Seattle. Taking care of my body is not such an important thing. So practically, without speaking a word, just by looking at me, Srila Prabhupada chose me to go to Australia. End of recollection by Upendra. Bali Madan's visa application was duly accepted. Handing over the charge of the Tokyo temple to Sudama, he was then free to go. When Prabhupada heard of the latest developments, he immediately wrote to Bali Madan expressing his happiness. Quote, If you take charge of the Sydney Centre, it will give me the greatest pleasure. My ambition is to open centres as much, sorry, as many as possible. At least I want to see that centres are opened in very important places. I know you are a very sincere Krishna consciousness preacher and Krishna will surely help you in your great adventure. So by this work, not only will you be blessed by Krishna, which is a spiritual gift, but also your name will be recorded in the history of the Krishna consciousness movement, which I'm sure is to grow to the largest volume of expansion. I shall always pray for your long life for preaching work in the service of the Lord. End of quote from Srila Prabhupada in a letter to Bali Madan. I always note that sentence. I'll read it to you again. You probably picked it up. Your name will be recorded in the history of the Krishna consciousness movement. And here it is, recorded. Upendra was now resigned to the fact that he was on his way to Australia. After brief, briefly training Nanda Kumar to replace him as Prabhupada's cook, he busied himself, busied himself reading travel pro brochures and collecting money for his fare. Australia at the time had quite a conservative immigration policy. One requirement was that a large amount of money, 1,500 Australian dollars, had to be shown to immigration upon arrival. Upendra managed to collect the fare, but he could not raise this show money, as it was called. Gagamuni Das, who ran a small import-export business in San Francisco, reluctantly agreed to lend him the money on the strict condition that Upendra return it immediately on his arrival in Australia. Yeah. We'll, we'll see what happened to that $1,500. 
Balimardan was also preparing for his trip and towards the end of the last week of January 1970, he received yet another encouraging letter from Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada wrote so many letters. I understand that you are now preparing to go to Australia, said Srila Prabhupada, and I am so much glad that you are so enthusiastic in preaching the transcendental cult of Krishna consciousness. Lord Chaitanya will be very pleased upon you. Lord Chaitanya desired that this cult of love of Krishna, which is the highest benefit for the living entities, shall be preached all over the world. As an intelligent boy, you can understand how much this Krishna consciousness movement is necessary for the upliftment of human society. End of letter from Srila Prabhupada to Bali Mardan. The musical Hair had opened on Broadway two years previously, attracting large crowds and a great deal of attention, particularly due to its scenes of unabashed nudity. Prabhupada noted to Bali Mardan in his letter that this highlighted the urgent need to spread Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada wrote, Due to their extraordinary materialistic way of life, the so-called civilised human society has degraded to the position of the animals. They are now dancing naked on the public stage and so-called respectable persons are going to enjoy such performances. The animals wander here and there naked, the monkeys walk naked and even the aborigines in the jungle they also cover their private parts by some skin or some tree of, or, or tree or leaf. I do not know how the so-called civilised men are gliding to the stage of animal life and still they are proud of their advancement of education and civilization. The position is very precarious. Somehow or other, under the order of my spiritual master, I have brought this cult of Krishna consciousness and handed it over to the American boys and girls. So I am appealing to everyone. I'm appealing to everyone, especially intelligent boys like you, to take up this propaganda work of the Krishna consciousness movement and take it very seriously. And it will be of great service to the human beings. We have now got vision books and literatures and our philosophy is super excellent. We are authorised and we shall go ahead more and more. Unquote. In early February of 1970, Bali Madan arrived in Sydney, Australia's largest city, with practically no money and only a few Back to Godhead magazines. I was living in Sydney then and I was 17 years old and I was in my last year of school. The young couple with whom Bali Madan had corresponded picked him up at the airport and accom accommodated him for a few days in their house in an outer Sydney suburb. They were friendly and willing to help and although not really interested in Krishna consciousness had helped him so far. Bali Mardana asked the couple where they suggested he go, some central spot in Sydney. They suggested King's Cross, which from their description sounded to Bali Mardana like the Greenwich village of Sydney. Next day, Bali Mardana moved to King's Cross where he found a cheap room and stayed for a week to become familiar with the area. Having distributed the few Back to Godhead magazines that he had brought with him from Japan, Bali Madan, on an off chance, contacted Macmillan Books, Mac Millen Books in North Sydney and found that they had a stock of Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita. The Macmillan Company had recently finished printing 1,500 hardbound copies and 35,000 paperback copies of Bhagavad Gita as it is. Although Macmillan had abridged the original Gita manuscript more than 50%, Prabhupada still considered it a victory. Quote, the first authorised parampara edition of Bhagavad Gita in the West, unquote, he said. Bali Maran purchased all that the Sydney branch of Macmillan had in stock and started to, to distribute them. He was confident 
that they were a powerful tool for spreading Lord Krishna's teachings throughout Australia. In ordering Srila Prabhupada to carry the message of Lord Chaitanya in the Western countries, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami had not specifically mentioned Australia. Yet Prabhupada knew that the desperate need for spreading Krishna consciousness everywhere uh, existed. Human life, Prabhupada said, was awarded to a living entity so that he could realize his spiritual identity and his permanent source of happiness. In Australia, like in any other Western country, people laboured hard and dedicated to the illusion of material happiness. Prabhupada was convinced that as it had been for the Americans, the power of God's holy name would cleanse away desire for material enjoyment from the hearts of the, of the Australians and awaken them to their real identities as loving servants of Krishna. The fact that Srila Prabhupada had sent only one devotee to Sydney was not without precedent. Prabhupada had already opened many branches by sending a sole person to a particular city. We do not require more men to start, Prabhupada had said. If there is one sincere soul, that is sufficient to start a new centre. Srila Prabhupada had spent his entire first year in America all alone or so it appeared. I was seemingly alone for one year, Srila Prabhupada said, but I never felt alone. I always felt the presence of my Guru Maharaj. A Vaishnava, he said, is never alone. Bali Madan remembered how Srila Prabhupada in his early days in America had sat down in Tomkins Square Park in New York and chanted. So with his single Madanga drum, Balimadan sat down in El Alamein Park in the middle of King's Cross, Sydney, and began to chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. The Australians that walked by, some eyeing Balimadan suspiciously, others incredulously, perhaps could not imagine the auspiciousness of this event. Here for the first time, a humble Vaishnava preacher was helping spread the powerful chanting of the holy names of Krishna. Even without their knowing, the people were participating and being benefited just by hearing this sound vibration. The 60s had just ended just weeks before and the 70s had started. And with the beginning of 1970 came potent spiritual life or Sydney. One day, a hippie couple who stopped to, hearing, to hear the chanting told Bali Madan of an abandoned house in nearby inner city Woolloomooloo. He quickly moved there to save paying rent. A few weeks later, on the 17th of February 1970, Upendra arrived at Sydney's International Airport. So now there was two. Exiting from a strict customs check, his eyes searched through the jostling, noisy crowds in the arrival lobby, looking for Bali Madan, whom he had never met. He thought he heard a madanga amongst the uproar. Yes, he did, and, and there was Bali Madan. Upendra recalls, I was quite surprised when I saw him. He was lanky, a bead bag around his neck, and wearing thick, rimless glasses. He wore a Prabhupada hat, which covered half his forehead, the straps hanging down over his three-day beard. He appeared unappealing to my eyes, rather like an ascetic, with a wrinkled kurta and similarly wrinkled jeans. I was expecting a little more, but at least the kirtan was heartwarming, said Upendra. Bali Madan helped Upendra with his bags and the two walked out of the terminal building greeted by a blast of hot Sydney summer air. Sydney had been experiencing heatwave conditions and temperatures were still soaring at 40 degrees, that's Celsius, not Fahrenheit, and above. An early model Holden taxi waited out the front 
Palimadan tapped on the window and a bleary-eyed, similarly dishevelled man awoke and slowly emerged from the back seat. Upendra recalls, As we drove towards the city, Balimadan introduced me to our red-eyed driver. He was Noel, a young, simple man who drove a taxi and was coming around and chanting a bit and helping out by donating some of his taxi earnings to, quote-unquote, the temple. I don't know what I imagined the temple to look like, but we soon arrived outside an abandoned house. It had no electricity, no hot water, and cockroaches as big as skateboards. I wasn't very, it wasn't very clean, and the wind blew through broken panes of glass. My bed was covered with sheets of newspaper. I just cried and cried. We were living in the squats. The next few days were difficult ones for Upendra, who had a hard time adjusting. How can we live like this? He asked Balimadan. Well, replied Balimadan, we have practically no money. We're saving up rent for a new place. Not long after, Balimadan located a small house in Potts Point, a suburb directly adjoining King's Cross. Although the dingy street was sometimes inhabited by drunks who slept in the gutter, it was better than the squats. Situated on a cliff face overlooking the vast expanse of inner city Sydney, with its dockyards and rolling parklands, the prominent blue building was quite suitable. It had a sunny compound and a few rooms, one with a veranda. The two young men wondered how they could afford it. Then Upendra remembered Gargamuni's loan, and the money was soon spent on the new house. It was clear to the two young men what Srila Prabhupada wanted them to do in Sydney. Follow his example from the early days at 26 Second Avenue, New York. That is, preaching, cooking, writing, talking, chanting. Bali Madan and Upendra knew that this was now a tried and tested formula. So many of their godbrothers and godsisters had gone to various places and tried the same process in Boston, St. Louis, Montreal, San Jose, Santa Fe, Hamburg, London, and they were meeting with success. And Prabhupada had several times reiterated what the actual standard of success was. I never thought about the audience, he had said. I was prepared to chant even if there was no one to hear me. The actual principle of chanting was to glorify the Lord, not to attract a crowd. If Krishna hears nicely, then he will ask some sincere devotees to gather in that place, Prabhupada had said. Balimadan and Upendra went out each day into the sunny streets and parks of inner Sydney, one chanting and one distributing literature. The small stock of Back to Godhead magazines had long been distributed. They had requested more from America, and now the Macmillan Bhagavad Gita's were practically all gone. Pendra recalls, almost immediately we wrote up a single-sided piece of paper with a picture of Srila Prabhupada and excerpts from his essay on chanting Hare Krishna and printed up copies which we sold for 20 cents. It wasn't much, but it was something. We'd hand them out and ask for two bob. Two bob, they'd say, for a piece of paper? But at the end of the day, we'd count up all our money. Bali Madan wrote to Prabhupada in Los Angeles with news of the Sydney Centre. Upendra had added a short postscript plus a clipping from a local newspaper, the first to appear in Sydney Press, entitled, Bali Has Brought a Message. The article described Bali Madan as being, quote unquote, high on God. Publishing the Hare Krishna mantra in full, the article described Bali Madan's mission, quote, Balim arrived in Sydney a fortnight ago after singing and dancing for six months in the streets of Tokyo. His hope is to establish a Sydney centre for Bhakti Yoga. One day, after returning home from Sankirtan, the men were happy to find a small blue aerogram inside the little mailbox next to the front gate. 
Balimardan eagerly opened the letter and read it aloud to Upendra. My dear Balimardan, please accept my blessings. I beg to acknowledge receipt of your very encouraging letter dated 18th of February 1970 and I have noted the contents carefully. It is also very much pleasing that you have liked the company of Upendra and both of you combined together will surely carry successfully our Australian Yatra. I'm very much pleased with your behaviour in the matter of progressing our Krishna consciousness movement. You took up very seriously my desire for opening a centre in Australia and you volunteered to take up the responsibility. So all these things are very much encouraging. In our Krishna consciousness movement, the first qualification required by the devotee is enthusiasm. Then work it out patiently and with conviction that it will surely be done. But at the same time, we must be very, very strict in following the regulative principles and completing the 16 rounds, chanting. Our dealings should be very clear with others and we must always keep company with devotees. Please do not hesitate to write me at least once a fortnight so that I may be kept informed of your activities. As you are doing so much for fulfilling the desire of my spiritual master, so you are, indirect, are indirectly the representative of my Guru Maharaj. He has been helping me in this matter by sending so many young boys and girls. Otherwise, who would help me with this mission while I came here empty-handed <coughs> and without any friend? I can only pray to Krishna to take care of you. Otherwise, I cannot repay your sincere service in my mission. Please offer my blessings to Upendra, and I am awaiting to hear from you again. Srila Prabhupada was proud of the achievements of his young disciples in Sydney. He happily sent news of their success along with copies of the first Sydney news clipping in his worldwide correspondence throughout the world in February and March of 1970. <coughs> Upendra and Bali Madan took Srila Prabhupada's request to write to him at least once every fortnight very seriously. In one such letter, Upendra had noted that it appeared that the Australian public did a, a great deal of reading. Prabhupada replied that this meant that there was a good scope for distributing books in Australia. Prabhupada stressed that there was already more than enough literature to satisfy even the most voracious appetite for reading matter. The three volumes of Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita as it is, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya, The Nectar of Devotion, and Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as well as Easy Journey to Other Planets. Srila Prabhupada suggested that the Sydney Centre also immediately order from Boston copies of the new Sri Isopanishad. The young men complied. Bali Madan had reported to Srila Prabhupada that considering the size of the crowds, that congregated as the young men performed Sankirtan, there appears to be a good opportunity for presenting Krishna consciousness to Australia's youth. He outlined his plans for chanting and book distribution on college campuses, starting with Sydney University. Prabhupada was happy to hear the news <clears throat> and he replied, I'm pleased to learn about the arrangements which you have already made here also in the States in two important Colleges, our teachings of Lord Chaitanya has been taken as a study course and two other colleges have purchased books, lots of books for their students. The books and literatures which we are presenting are unparalleled, at least in the Western countries. So if you can convince the parties concerned, you can also introduce our books and literatures for the study in various university circles. I am awaiting your report of the university meeting, your sincerity of purpose will itself help you more and more because the Lord is sitting within your heart and as soon as he sees that you are required to do something in his service he will immediately give you all facilities. Although Srila Prabhupada was not generally in favour of importing devotees, he preferred that devotees be made from local men and women, he conceived of a unique plan for Australia. Prabhupada had the idea of sending young brahmacharis from England 
to help with the preaching in Australia, and he had written to Mukunda in London as follows. I have received word that English citizens can fly to Australia as immigrants, and the cost is only $20 per person. So under the circumstance, you can send some brahmacharis to help out our new centre in Sydney. This will be the best, because the British government will bear the expense of their transportation. Also, you can help them out by sending them the papers of ISKCON Limited from London, so they can immediately incorporate as a Commonwealth branch the two... Uh, <clears throat> the Sydney address is as follows. ISKCON Temple, 26 Hordens Place, Potts Point, New South Wales, 2011. The chanting of Hare Krishna was becoming well known in Sydney. The Hare Krishna single, with the devotees chanting Hare Krishna with George Harrison, the famous Beatle, <coughs> released in October 1968 on the Apple label, was now fourth on Sydney's top 50. Number four on the top 50. And steadily climbing. The newly opened musical hair, with the rousing Hare Krishna chanting as its finale, was playing to a packed house in the Metro Theatre, King's Cross. I went to see it with my friends as a young schoolboy. The two young devotees pushed on their preaching efforts and gradually a few people showed more than a passing interest in their Sankirtan efforts. To be continued. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. See you next time. Thank you very much.